SpaceX's Starlink is expanding fast. Is the Boca Chica concrete finally going to be protected? There's a new European startup that's just received funding and a lot more is coming up in Monday's Tomorrow Space News. We'll get on to the lack of static fire in a second, but first, Chip 28's nose cone has been scooting over to High Bay 1, potentially for stacking operations. So then, the big talking point of the week, the 33 engine static fire, or the lack of the 33 engine static fire. During the downtime, a couple Raptor 2 engines underneath Booster 7, the Super Heavy Booster, currently slated to perform the orbital flight test, have been swapped out with brand new ones. It's not been confirmed whether or not the swaps have been because of dodgy data in the wet dress rehearsal, or newer engines are just available to be used. There's one thing we do know, however, the concrete under the pad is going to be under a lot of pressure, with 33 of some of the world's most powerful rocket engines firing away. So, what could we do to suppress those forces? The port of Brownsville has seen the arrival of a barge which started its journey at the Turn Basin at the Kennedy Space Center. On board are some tanks, the beginnings of a transport stand, and some water deluge pipes. Hmm, I wonder what they'll be used for. These were later delivered to the launch site by truck. Some new foundations have been laid near the orbital pad, which in conjunction with the arrival of the water deluge plumbing has led people to incorrectly assume that some kind of water tower is being constructed here. That's not the case however, as what will actually be put here are those white tanks we saw arriving on the barge. Enough of the ship, let's look at the link, as it's been expanded to three countries and another airline in just seven days. Nigeria has approved the space-based internet service, becoming the first nation on the African continent to do so. According to data from speedtest.net, the average internet connection in Nigeria achieved 11.4 megabits per second download and 9.87 megabits per second upload, which is far lower than the capabilities of the Starlink constellation. The South American continent has also become more accessible, with Colombia accepting the service within its borders. The country isn't the first on the continent, however, which has already seen service provided to the majority of Brazil, Peru, Chile and French Guiana. And the third country to join the Cool Kids Club is Italy. This edition makes Starlink available to the vast majority of Europeans, with the only areas currently off limits being Iceland, the Faroe Islands, the northern half of the Shetlands, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, Belarus, and that little awkward sticky out bit of Turkey that's technically classed as Europe. Apart from Belarus, all those countries and regions will be getting Starlink soon, however. The newest airline to sign up for the Starlink aviation service is Zip Air, a Japanese low-cost carrier based out of Tokyo Narita Airport. Free internet is already available on board all of their flights, which are performed with a fleet of four Boeing 7878 Dreamliners. Zip Air is aiming to increase the connectivity speed on board all of their aircraft by introducing Starlink, allowing customers to do more whilst they're flying in the air. With the announcement from Air Baltic only a few weeks ago, it seems that airlines are starting to catch the Starlink bug, so who do you think will announce a partnership next? The Exploration Company is a new aerospace startup based out of Munich, Germany and Bordeaux, France. They've recently secured a 40.5 million euro investment through some Series A funding, helping them to get their NICS capsule off the ground. Their first mission is planned to be a rideshare on the inaugural flight of the Ariane 6 with a 40 kilo, 60 centimeter diameter re-entry demonstrator called Bikini. I'm not kidding. The data gathered during this test flight will go on to aid their next flight, which is going to be an embiggened demonstrator capsule, measuring in at 2.5 metres across. This will be launched on a Falcon 9 in 2024. And then finally in 2026, the first full flight of their full-scale NYX spacecraft will commence, weighing in at 8 metric tonnes. Eventually, the exploration company hoped to have NYX operating as a modular, reusable and refuelable vehicle capable of carrying cargo and crew to multiple space stations orbiting Earth, all for the low cost of €20,000 per kilo. Their ambitions aren't just locked into low Earth orbit, however, as they want to deliver payload to the lunar gateway and to the lunar surface. They're predicting that Nix will have the performance to deliver 2 tonnes to the moon and 5.5 tonnes to gateway, all for just €150,000 per kilo. SmallSat launch provider Virgin Orbit has received another investment from the Virgin Group, this time being a sum of 10 million US dollars. 
and this has become a frequent occurrence with 25 million being invested last November and another 20 million being invested in December. With their recent failure on January 9th, they also won't be launching for a while, reducing their earnings from customers. This would have also been made worse by the amount of time they were waiting in Cornwall for their launch license, meaning they couldn't get back to Mojave for more launches. I'm hoping that with the financial mass of the Virgin Group behind them, Virgin Orbit will be able to succeed and start to compete with the current dominant force in the small sat launching industry, Rocket Lab. Their ability to launch from anywhere on Earth will open up new opportunities for projects from places you wouldn't even think of launching traditionally, and for that capability to no longer be available would be a big shame to the countries who are looking forward to their own domestic space capability. Time for space traffic and wow, what a surprise, it's another Starlink launch, but with a big milestone attached as this was the 200th launch attempt of the Falcon 9. Only 49 V1.5 satellites were inside the payload fairing, but there's a good reason for that as there was a rideshare payload as well. Ion SCV-009, a 64 unit CubeSat dispenser from D-Orbit. Once deployed from the second stage of the Falcon 9, it deployed satellites individually whilst changing its orbital parameters to meet the client's respective demands. I do wonder if the company had thought through their name as I'm pretty sure none of D-Orbit's customers would like their payloads deorbited. All of the payloads aboard were launched on the 31st of January at 1615 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. They were delivered to an initial 339 by 327 km 70 degree orbit before deploying from the second stage of the Falcon 9 where I'm glad to say none of them deorbited. After serving its purpose well, Booster B1071 concluded its seventh flight touching down on Of Course I Still Love You off the coast of Baja, California in the Pacific Ocean. The fairings were scooped up by the West Coast support ship NRC Quest. This was SpaceX's 94th consecutive booster landing, so fingers crossed they can keep up the streak and make it to the big 100. Next up was another launch from SpaceX and another launch of a batch of Starlink satellites. This time it was for Mission 3 of Group 5, filled to the brim with V2 mini satellites. Launching at 0758 on Thursday, the 2nd of February, all 53 satellites were delivered to their initial 325 by 343 km 43 degree orbit, whilst the first stage, B1069, returned to Earth, concluding its flight on a shortfall of Gravitas. The fairing halves were scooped up by support ship Bob. Don't worry, it's not another Starlink launch, instead the Proton was launching for the first time this year, as at 0912 UTC on Friday, Electro L No. 4 was launched on this Proton M from Site 8124 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The three-ton payload is a weather satellite joining a constellation that has been launching over the last decade. This specific satellite was delivered to a 166 degree geosynchronous orbit. Coming up over the next seven days, SpaceX are launching Amazonas Nexus from Cape Canaveral, Rose Cosmos are launching the Progress MS-22 resupply mission to the International Space Station, the ISRO are launching EOS-7 and a rideshare payload on an SSLV, SpaceX could be launching Starlink Group 5 Mission 4 on Saturday, and because of a delay with the Mitsubishi launch, that's all of the launches for the next week. As always, thank you to the citizens of Tomorrow who helped to fund the show. If you want access to some cool perks alongside your regular Tomorrow experience, consider joining the Grand Support, Suborbital, Orbital, Escape Velocity, or Plaid Pro Plus citizens. Or for as little as 99 US cents per month, you could join the System Support members and still get access to our always entertaining post-live show member hangout. You can find out more information at the join button below or join.tomorrow.tv. Coming up over the next seven days, we have another space weather update from Dr. Timothy Scove that you won't want to miss, a classic Tomorrow Friday live show, and the weekly space news returning next Monday. But for now, thank you for tuning in, have a good rest of your week, and goodbye.